working on habitat effects on individual condition. He then did a postdoc at the very prestigious uh, Fitzpatrick Institute of Ornithology in South Africa and working on migration. And he's gonna talk about that work tomorrow. So do come back tomorrow. He now works up in the Yukon, the Yukon University, where he is a policy analyst for Workers' Safety and Compensation Board. He is also maintaining his research associate role at the Fitzpatrick Institute in South Africa. And he's also a naturalist on Silver Seas cruise ships. So he travels the world for part of the year. So here is our speaker for today. Okay. Can everyone hear me clearly? Okay, thumbs up. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to start by saying that um, I'm really humbled to, to be here. Thank you all very much for uh, the gift of your time and, um, and to the university for, for, bringing me, um, for bringing me in. And uh, yes, as introduced, um, I am gonna be talking, just giving an overview about the study of um, avian uh, migration. So the patterns and strategies that are observed in, in birds. Um, but before we get into that, I thought I'll just start by saying greetings from the Yukon. Uh, so um, I, in addition to all that has been said, um, I also like to play with art. So I do enjoy photography um, on the side and Yes, the Northern Lights, Aurora Borealis. Um, I did take this photo. Um, I was safely inside where it was nice and warm and just through the window, just out there. It's, it's really beautiful um, up in the Yukon. Um, this was taken in uh, Marsh Lake, which is about 40 or so minutes outside of uh, Whitehorse. Uh, if you do get the chance, yeah, please come visit. Um, so, um, as said, I, I have had the pleasure, um, but it's also been sort of my honor to work in a diversity of roles. Um, I have taken an approach to, to live in where um, I'm trying to um, learn as much from the diversity of experiences. Uh, so I work on board expedition cruise ships as an expedition lecturer. So on board, I am the bird guy. Um, and I've been fortunate enough with Silver Sea uh, cruises to go up to the Arctic, to go down to Antarctica and everywhere in between. Um, so I, my claim to fame is that I've been to all seven continents. Um, it's, it gets very, I've also been fortunate enough to live on, whew, I think I've held an address on, I think it's probably four continents. Um, so when you have to apply for a visa and they say, you know, give us a police report for all the countries that you've lived in since you've been 16, that's when it's not, that's when it's not fun. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I do enjoy doing that. Um, for those interested in migration, um, I am a part of the Migrant Land Bird Study Group. Uh, and, and we, it's set up for professional and amateurs uh, who have an interest in bird migration. Um, I think there's a website and yep, yeah, there's a lot that can be looked into. I enjoy field work. Um, very recently, um, a friend contacted me and he set up this master class um, on finances, but he wants to set up, uh, it's called Finance Unlocked, uh, but he wants to set up one for environment. So it's called Sustainability Unlocked. And he wanted um, experts to give like a master class style um, teaching. So that's also available online. And I've been glad, I'm, I, I learned a lot um, from all of these experiences. Um, I worked uh, policy uh, for CMS, the Convention on Migratory Species. Uh, that is the part of the UN that is responsible for all migratory species, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. So this is largely uh, who I am. And today, um, the overview is going to 
We're going to talk about maybe what migration is in itself. Um, I will try to share some what I hope will be wow stories about um, animal migration and their movements. And then we'll look at the actual study of it. Um, and how we've been able to get to the point where we are. I know not everyone in the room studies birds, so I've worked in some non-avian examples in there, um, but the idea is to think about migration as broadly as, um, as, as, as we can. Um, so I like to think of myself as a teacher, and I think that um, teachers have three eyes, I like to call it. Um, a teacher can offer you information, one plus one is two, and that's just knowledge. Um, a teacher can offer you instruction, um, and that gets you to understand sort of why if you have one orange and I give you another orange, that is two. So now you understand how addition works, and that you can call intelligence. Um, but I would like to say that the best of teachers give inspiration because it's not capped there. They now say, okay, now you know how to add, run with it. Where can you go with this new knowledge that you have? And for me, that's inspiration and that is wisdom. Um, so I'm hoping through this that, yeah, not just grad students, but everyone hopefully will draw some sort of inspiration that you can take from here and run with it. Hopefully, we'll see. Let me know at the end of the talk. Um, so migration, a good place to often start is, let's just go back. Um, so looking into prehistoric times, migration has been recorded um, and it's been discussed, in some cases argued. Uh, so there's, this guy here, um, the Plateosaurus, uh, that was recorded to have walked um, over 100,000 uh, 100, kilometers from South America to Greenland. Um, and that was about 214 million years ago. Uh, of course, nobody was around to see it, uh, but uh, fossil records and uh, carbon dating, um, that sort of, if we're talking about maybe earliest forms of migration, yeah, maybe that would be uh, there. I will quickly say here that a lot of the work that I will be um, referencing in today's seminar are not necessarily mine. Um, so where possible, I've offered the uh, the citation, and yeah, if you're interested, you can follow you can follow that up. Um, now, I mentioned that I've worked for CMS. Uh, that is the Convention on Migratory Species. That is the arm of the United Nations that is responsible for all animals that migrate, um, not humans, non-human animals that migrate. And the way I like to describe them is they're responsible for all animals from the monarch, uh, butterfly, to the blue whale and everything in between. So in terms of fun wild stories, I'd like to start with the monarch, um, the monarch butterfly. And they migrate, they have a northward migration from Mexico all the way sort of up into even parts of Canada. That's amazing. This little butterfly probably weighs as much as a postage stamp, some would say covers that kind of distance. But for me, the coolest part when it comes to understanding migration in this particular species is that the northward migration is actually done over one, two, three, four generations. So it's not the individual that lives, that leaves Mexico City, that lives the wintering ground, that actually arrives at the northern destination. So, I mean, that's really cool. So it, it generally means that these individuals in, within the species are able to pass on travel information to the next generation. And they continue the journey. For me, that's just, that just blows my mind. Okay, how do they do that? How do they pass on that information? Um, I don't know. Just putting it out there, I don't know. But still fascinating. And um, now I'm guessing someone's thinking, at least I was, what about when they come back south? One generation. So somehow one generation comes south, but going up north 
it takes four generations and that's just cool. So next time you're with friends and you're talking and someone says anything about butterflies, you're like, fun fact, how many generations? <laughs> All right, anyhow, I, I just like to play with that. Next one, cuckoo. So this is the, uh, the common cuckoo. And uh, cuckoos are brood parasites. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. So um, not other cuckoos, other species. And cuckoos are born knowing that they are cuckoos. So there are tons of videos online, nest cameras that show this little blind hatchling getting itself under the other eggs and tossing them out of the nest. It's born knowing that I am a cuckoo, I'm gonna get rid of all competition around me and you're gonna feed me. But what is super cool about them is that, so these birds, you'll find them on the um, other side of the pond. So in Europe, and they migrate between Europe and Africa. Now, <laughs> what makes it super cool is that a young cuckoo, without having met another cuckoo, will know when it's time to migrate. It will know what direction to go, and it will travel from Europe to Africa and back. Let's ratchet up, a, let's take it up a notch. They are solitary nocturnal migrants. That means they migrate alone at night, <laughs> and they travel from Europe to Africa. Let's add one more layer to that. Casper <laughs> uh, Thorup, uh, he's, really uh, he's a really good friend. Um, he's based in Denmark. Decided to do some displacement experiments on cuckoos, adults and young ones. So young ones that have never migrated. And what they did was they displaced them right across. And this is what is expected. So if the idea is, okay, they just head south in a straight line. If you move them across, say, to the east, then this is what should happen, right? They should just head straight down. This is what happened. So they moved a couple of guys out to the east. They adjusted. They moved a couple of guys out to the west, and they adjusted. Never having, this is for the young ones now, never having done the journey, never having met another cuckoo, they knew where to go. Fascinating for me, I think. <laughs> and um, this is the woodland kingfisher. This is one of my photos. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and um, I'm, I'll be talking about this uh, in more detail tomorrow. And um, not quite as amazing as the common cuckoo, but uh, they migrate uh, so the, one of the populations that we studied migrate from South Africa. They do a transequatorial migration. So they cross the, um, the equator and then they winter um, areas of uh, South Sudan and then they wander, they wander back. And um, with these individuals, we are still figuring out um, how the young also know how to go because they are also solitary nocturnal migrants. And we've actually found that the females will leave before the male does. And we're still trying to figure out whether the male leaves with the young or without. And then the young ones just figure out their own migration. So when it comes to migration in itself, there are so many cool stories that we are just trying to get our heads around. What I'm hoping in the course of this talk is first of all to wow you, which I'm hoping I've been able to achieve. But next, talk about how we've been sort of studying migration. Um, but then the, first, the, the question that comes from that is, what is migration? And there are a number of definitions. It's, you know, everyone's got their own idea of what migration is or should be. Um, I like to fall back on the CMS definition. Um, I mean, after all, it is the United Nations. We can trust them. We do, we do, we do, I do. Uh, <laughs> but um, so I also like, uh, so this is the definition for CMS uh, of, what, um, of what migration is and what a migratory species uh, is. And um, 
I often like to draw attention to that last part where they cross one or more national jurisdictional boundaries. That means that according to CMS, you are only a migrant if you have a passport. <laughs> that chicken does not look too amused, but um, no, it's just something that, that I do like to play with. Um, but in terms of the definition itself, I'm not gonna give you a definition, uh, a working definition, but I will give you elements of what makes it migration. So there are four elements. Uh, you need to have movement, it needs to be predictable, it needs to be cyclic, and it needs to be benefit-based. And I'm just gonna unpack this uh, a little bit. So movement in space and or time. And uh, it's quite easy, you know, I moved from here, I moved to there, movement has occurred. Um, but one of the classic um, misconceptions around migration is that of swallows, because up until a point in time, it was actually believed that swallows hibernated underwater. And they would fly around and then in, in, um, in autumn, because they saw them around uh, lakes, they just, it was assumed that they just went underwater. And there were even, you know, drawings of people fishing swallows from, from water. And before we all turn our noses up and, you know, just like, oh, how could you believe that? Aristotle himself also believed it. <laughs> and it was actually documented um, in his um, animal uh, history uh, publication. And even uh, Carl Nias, one of his students also wrote about swallows hibernating in lakes. Um, quite interesting, but we know now that they don't. They, they actually move from, uh, in, from say one country or one continent to, to the other. Um, but yes, so movement is one thing that you definitely want to have happen. Now this movement needs to be predictable. Now, many of us think of migration as being seasonal, but there is also daily migration. It can be diurnal. So in, um, in certain water bodies, it's been recorded that, um, oops, sorry, is that me? Um, certain uh, zooplanktons and uh, the, uh, a, a lot of um, other um, sort of um, ah, diatoms, diatoms, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, they will move within the water column up and down with um, with the passage of light. So this is just consider this to be one entire 24 hour cycle. Uh, so as it gets dark, they move up, less predators. As it gets light, they move down. And that is migration um, also. It's daily, um, not the seasonal migration some of us might uh, be more accustomed uh, to. Next is that migration needs to be cyclic. So that means you need to go from point A to point B and back to point A, not just off to never come back to A. If you never come back, that is not migration. You're just going for a walk. You're, it's, um, it, uh, that's called being a vagrant. Um, it, you're just wandering. Uh, and with that, um, I'd like to introduce the concept of uh, migratory, um, migratory, uh, migration connectivity, where uh, as individuals from one uh, site move to another, the more individuals move from one site to the other, the stronger the connectivity between these two sites will be. So there's strong migration connectivity between this site and this, but it's weaker between this site and that site, and it's weakest between this site and that migration connectivity might have been discussed. And the last is that it needs to be benefit-based. Uh, so you need to be gaining something or avoiding something. And the example is from Nigeria, where I come from. And I talk about the Fulani her herdsmen. They move from the Northern part of Nigeria to the South. Um, now, in the, when, it's, when it's a dry season, they move South. Uh, but when it's the rainy season, the sissy fly shows up. So they move 
north. They leave all that lovely grass in the south and go get the grass up in the north because in the rainy season, they've got grass in the north without the sissy flies. So you have those four elements and that is generally what you should look for in any form of migration. Now, um, coming back to the CMS definition, it talks about a significant portion of members and I'll talk about different types of migration because you can have complete migration where everybody in the population moves or partial where only some individuals move. You can have differential where a particular group, whether the males or the females or the adults or the young migrate, or you can have interruptive where this year they migrate, eh, next year they don't. So that can also happen when you begin to sort of look into migration. Having talked about that, you kind of, um, it just leads us to migrants and residents. And there is a body of work. Um, I'm not a geneticist, but I do collaborate with them. And we talk about the clock gene and uh, telomere, and that is measuring the length of these, of these genes. And it does indicate whether you're a migrant or not. So um, individuals with shorter telomeres are considered to be given more to being migrants than not. And what often happens is that there is a migratory restlessness that occurs in them, where in non-migratory species at night, they're not active. But in migratory species, even at night, at the time of migration, you get a lot of activity from them, almost similar to the activity you'll get during the day. They've just got this restlessness, they've got to go. All right, just taking a pause here. <laughs> Moving on to the next sort of um, part of this. So bird mi birds migrate in, they do so along super highways, which we call flyways for birds. But then the question is, how do we know? So how do we know the birds? So take, for example, the East Atlantic Flyway. That's the red one. How do we know the birds from here kind of end up here? Well, bird banding or, well, in the, on the American side of things, we call it bird banding. On the uh, European side of things, we call it bird ringing. That is one of the first ways that we sort of cottoned onto the idea um, and knowing where birds were, because then you started trapping them and you could pick up on these rings and read the individual ring number. And I just thought I would acknowledge the first person who ever did this, um, uh, a Danish uh, guy, Hans Christian Cornelius uh, Mortensen. He is the first to put rings on a bird for research uh, purposes. Telemetry is the other way where we put geolocators on birds. Once again, my dear woodland uh, kingfisher, and it's got the geolocator on the back. And um, geolocators measure the amount of light or dark. And you can now use that. Um, if you know where you, when you put the geolocator on the bird, there, you, you get a measure of light and dark. Uh, that's over a 24 hour period. And as the bird migrates north and south, except during the solstice and the equinox, um, you can sort of know where the bird is um, on uh, the, the latitude um, of the bird based on the amount of daylight and uh, darkness. But the other cool one is satellite transmitters, which um, you kind of, I'm just gonna jump forward a bit. This is the Ardea cuckoo again, and I'll just come right back. Uh, you put it on the bird, and many of them have a, a solar panel source. Uh, oh, I, will, I forgot something. I'll, I'll talk about it more tomorrow. But with the geolocators, you generally have to catch the bird again. So I put this on this individual bird. And 11 months later, a year later, I need to catch this guy again and take that geolocator off its back. Otherwise, the data is lost. Um, I, I can also talk about all kinds of technology that's being developed. And there is some, some advances being made with geolocator technology where the geolocator will be able to transmit probably once to a GSM, to a cell phone, to a cell, um, a cell phone uh, tower, and then you can retrieve your data uh, on your phone. Um, so that is actually happening. But for the work that I did that I'll talk about tomorrow, I had to do it the old fashioned way, catch that guy again. Uh, but with 
satellite transmitters, you don't have to catch the individual again um, because the information on the GPS at a predetermined period gets transmitted to a satellite, which is then picked up somewhere on Earth, and then the researcher gets it. So you can get real-time data, probably for the lifetime of the bird, about where this bird is. Um, now, the British Trust for Ornithology, the BTO, they have um, an ongoing soap opera uh, that you can tune into. Uh, they tag cuckoos, they give them a name, and then the cuckoo has a channel on the website. And you can figure out where Chris is at any point in time. Is Chris in Africa? You know, what's he doing? And he's about to migrate back up north. And they have, and, and this is really great because it helps people tune in to science actually. So members of the public have um, different cuckoos that they are cheering for. And, and sometimes these birds will die on migration. Um, the satellite transmitter will just stop moving. And now you need a team to sort of go in and ground truth and figure out what, what has happened or, or not. Um, but it's been a big success um, in getting people interested in birds in, in the UK. Uh, that is um, just following the migration of a particular bird in real time. Well, when I say in real time, uh, it, it, does take, it does take a while for this process to happen for the data to be transmitted and then to be sent to the researcher. So it's not minute per minute. Sometimes you will get the update. Um, it will, there's a lag time, which could be a couple of days to weeks. And um, I include this, um, this uh, publication um, because scientists, we are not infallible. I, I like to put it out there that we make mistakes. And uh, this paper di discusses some of the errors around uh, geolocators. And uh, I think a particular set of geolocators were used in the study that had a bit of a bulbous end. And what unfortunately happened is that birds ended up getting trapped in trees and they found eight birds that were entangled in trees just because of the geolocator. Um, and they were able to free some of them. And uh, yeah, so it's work in progress. It's not perfect science, but it does help. Uh, it does help us learn more about what is happening um, out there in terms of the movement of the birds. Next stage, um, just gonna give a shout out to those who, anyone, does anyone, anyone familiar with this logo? Oh. Orienteering. Do we have any orienteers around? It's a really cool sport where you get a map and you got to get from point A to point B and then from point B to point C and you've got to figure it out, but it's a race. So who's the fastest person to figure out how to move around? It's, it's a lot of fun. And there is actually orienteering going on in Utah. I checked it when I was, when I arrived. It's a lot of fun. It's really good. Uh, it develops your map reading skills. Um, it's not just how fast you can run. Uh, you need to also be able to sort of read a map. And that brings me to orientation and navigation in birds. And there are a number of ways that, um, you know, birds um, orient and navigate. So orientation is basically always having an awareness of where you are. Um, and then navigation is knowing that I need to get to point B, and this is how I'm going to, this is my route to sort of get there. Um, birds have different um, tools for orienting and navigating. And um, over here, this um, imagery just sort of highlights a few of them. So yes, the Earth magnetic field is used. Um, uh, the sun, uh, so um, uh, using the the sun and the stars at, at night for those that migrate at, at night as well. But as the birds get uh, on a sort of on a finer scale, um, yes, birds will use landmarks, and uh, sometimes um, there is Earth Earth. Anyone familiar with the Earth Day uh, celebration? And that is when, for those that are not, um, that is when we're all encouraged to turn out the lights at night um, to help migratory birds um, when they are moving. Because um, what we need to understand is that this migration has been happening like long before we built cities. 
and birds are familiar with what the, um, the, the, the contour of the land and the shape, and they are trying to understand light and light pollution and what all of this means. And in many cases, there have been um, records of uh, birds and other species going off track into major cities, being attracted by the light just because it wasn't there before. What structure is that? And they get they, 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 com they completely fly off course. Um, I'm not necessarily gonna dwell on that much, but just to get you to understand that birds do use a number of tools um, in migrating. One of those that I will like to sort of draw on um, is, um, they, it's, this, it's the story of the um, Emnel Funnel. My <laughs> that keeps getting stuck. Um, now, this was one of those ones that clued us in to the tools that birds use to migrate. So it was a, it was a funnel set up and the bird is on an ink pad and you've got sort of paper 360 around the, the funnel and they leave the bird there for about 60 minutes. And they try to see what direction the bird is gonna try to get out of the funnel. Um, it's covered on top. And in, um, in, uh, in autumn, this was done in Europe. In autumn, they realized that the bird was always trying to head south. It was trying to get out of the funnel in a southward uh, direction. And they thought, oh, okay, it's because the bird can see the stars. So they brought the funnel inside, closed it off. The bird was still trying to get out, heading south. And they kind of started trying to figure out what else, the, what other cues the bird could be using. And eventually they zeroed in on magnetic fields, that birds can sense the magnetic field of the earth. Um, now, just to progress that story a little bit. So that is north. This was kind of um, the, in spring, birds are generally trying to go north. In autumn, birds are generally trying to go um, trying to go south, but they were like, "Okay, how are birds able to sense the magnetic field?" Oh, sorry, I did miss one little bit, and that was the bit where they put two very big magnets on either side of the funnel, and then created an artificial north and an artificial south, and the birds went with it. So once they could create the magnetic field, they knew that okay, birds could sense the magnetic field. And um, that's great for us. It was not so great for birds because everyone was not trying to figure out how do the birds do it? And everyone, it, so there were a couple of hypotheses that were floated. Um, one was that, uh, that's the induction hypothesis that birds had a liquid in their bill that could sort of uh, it was filled with this liquid that uh, that had ions that were sensitive to uh, to the magnetic uh, field of the Earth, so they would know which way to go. So a lot of birds kind of got dissected; they didn't find liquid, so they moved on to the next one: um, iron mineral-based hypothesis, which is that within the bill or within the brain um, of the bird, there were minute uh, metals that were sensitive to. Uh, magnetic uh, to, to magnetic fields, so the bird could sort of feel which way was left or right, and uh, sorry, north or south. Again, no, they did not find enough, and unfortunately, a couple of birds got, did get dissected. The leading hypothesis is the light-dependent hypothesis, and I will say that it is one that I find myself leaning towards. Now, I'm leaning towards it because humans. We are trichromatic. That means we see in three light spectra, RGB, red, green, blue. Birds are tetrachromatic. So they have RGB and UV, ultraviolet. I'm not a physicist, um, but I'm talking to a friend of mine who is a physicist, and she got excited when I got, when we started talking about this because based on what I know, light acts both as a wave and a particle. And light 
as a particle actually does um, interact in the UV spectra with um, magnetic fields. Now, I can't explain how that happens. I'm hoping to do a collaborative talk with her where this is the point where I will stop talking and she'll jump in and she'll explain the physics of it, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but basically, the light, my, uh, my understanding of the, of the light-based uh, hypothesis is that based on the way the eyes of the birds are um, uh, structured, being tetrachromatic, they can literally see the magnetic fields of the earth, or they can see magnetic fields as you create it around them. And for me, that's just super, super fascinating. Um, so this is just, you know, in the, in the short time that I have, I thought I'll just touch on a bunch of stories here and there and maybe get you enthused about migration in itself. Um, there is a lot happening. There are a number of species moving. Uh, this is um, a poster that's, uh, that was developed by National Geographic. Uh, this part of the poster just shows the Nearctic uh, migration. That is migration between uh, the North American continent and the South American continent. But there is also Palearctic migration between Europe and Africa and Asia as well. Birds, but not only birds all kinds of species are moving around across our planet. And it is, I would say incumbent on us um, as one of the species that has had the largest footprint on this planet to be more and more aware of it. Um, to this end, uh, CMS does try to celebrate um, the World Migratory Bird Day every year. Uh, so this year, it's gonna be happening in May and in October. Um, any idea why it's happening twice a year? Someone, someone, give me something, give me something. Oh, come on. Yeah, when they're going down and when they're coming back up. <laughs> so spring migration and autumn migration. Um, and this is celebrated. And this year, the theme is around water. And um, we're just there, you can go online, you can find out how you can create an event around the World Migratory Bird Day to celebrate birds. People are doing a whole lot of things. I do believe that awareness is, is key. Um, and um, speaking to the scientists in the room, um, I do think that we, can and we should get better at communicating uh, with the wider community. Uh, we know we are getting messages from, from the planet, from our studies, oh, this is changing and that is happening, but we can't make all the changes on our own. Uh, we need the general public and we need to be able to communicate in a way that the message gets across. So whether it's through raising awareness and organizing an event, whether it's through organizing lectures such as this, whether it's through talking to my grandmother, um, whatever we can do to get that message across, I would generally implore that we all uh, take this on. And um, just sort of bringing things to a close, I will go back to where we started. I talked about the dinosaur that walked from uh, South America to, to Greenland. Um, and my question to you is, just for fun, does this qualify as migration? I'm hearing a no, I'm hearing two no's. Do I get a yes? Oh, come on people. <laughs> It wasn't. <laughs> I thought you were going to hit me with the cyclic one because there were no records of them going back. But the government boundaries, the national jurisdiction, it didn't have a passport. Yes, there were no countries then. So that's not migration. No, but um, I do welcome you to uh, just play with this uh, a little bit. I hope I've been able to share something that has kind of uh, stayed with you. And um, with that, I would like to say, Thank you um, for the honor of your time, for listening. And um, yes, I'll take uh, any questions. Thank you.